The city of Portland is Amen. ready. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning. Sit that right there. There we go. All right. Before we get started, because we're going to cover some scripture this morning, but we wanted to share a couple of testimonies. So, try to get all that done there. There we go. <clears throat> it's rough having Nate lead worship before I preach because I end up crying and all that stuff and then you come out here and, it's, and you're doing this a constant song. But <clears throat> um, <clears throat> last night, uh, I'd made mention about if you want to get started, you want to get plugged in, about the life teams and all that. <clears throat> and I made statements about people that got started really before we even knew them, before we'd ever met. And, you know, as we were talking about, like, activation, activation is you acting. You, you act. You start. And then uh, you don't have to have someone activate you. You hear the truth. Actually, I was just talking back with Georgia that, the word conscience, everywhere it's used in the New Testament, literally means to be conscious of. So the minute you become conscious of truth, your conscience then is being that conscious of, which means as soon as you learn a truth, you become responsible to act on that truth. That's what conscience is. Now, so this morning we have a couple of people that uh, some have known for a while, but also, we, we have a couple that we just met here. Uh, but we wanted to give them an opportunity just to share a little bit of how they got started and how the message works for them. Because the real key to this is not that I can do this. The key is you've got to be able to do it. And still in people's minds, a lot of times, the idea is, well, he can do it because of this or this or whatever. No, it's just I got fed up being normal and started doing it. And that's what we teach. And so we're going to get... Uh, a couple of people to come up and share with us. We're going to get, actually first get Marty, if you want to come on up. You can, as long as they can, yeah, that'll work. Uh, right there, I guess, okay. I guess. No Probably be easier, yeah, faster. No problem. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Marty. This is my wife, Bridget. We're from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And this is some of our, our team that we have back in Calgary. Amen. Um, so, I was saved probably 20 years ago. And I spent 17 years of that in religious bondage. I mean, it was, it was horrible. I never had any freedom. I mean, there was moments of freedom when you come to a conference, you feel wonderful, and within a couple of days, you're just down in the trenches again. And it, this is the way it was for a long time. And I would go to my pastors, and I would say, look what we see in the Bible. And they'd say, well, we just have to wait. You know? And I said, why don't we see healing in our church? And he said, well, I'm trying to figure out that too, but I, I'm standing at the altar with you know, the Bible under my arm. You know? And I said, well, the, the Bible's closed, and you're at the altar. Let's go do something. You know? And nothing ever made sense. I was always told to wait, and I always felt a call of God on my life, and nothing ever seemed to work. And then about three and a half years ago, um, my dad, my stepfather, had a mental breakdown, and he was away from the Lord for about 30 years. And he quit his job, very high paying job, and he got turned back onto God and he literally dedicated his life to God for about a year and a half. And then he met some, found some people on YouTube and saw these healing things and felt a call to go down to Mexico uh, with Pastor, this man named Pastor Juan. And while he was down there, he would report to me about all these miracles he was seeing. There's actually a video of my dad holding a baby while he prayed for this lady's broken arm and he felt the bone grow underneath his hand. And he would report back to me, and I'd say, well, you know, that's God just doing stuff down in Mexico. You know, there's, we'll see if the anointing comes back to Canada. Come on. <laughs> right? So, and we talked about that with my wife and my mom. We'll see what happens. So, about, he was down there for four months, and three and a half months in, uh, he got very ill. And we got a phone call saying, you better get down to Mexico. Uh, your dad is, is sick. And then somebody else called us and said, you don't understand how grave this is. You need to go. So we got on a plane, we got down there on a Friday. Um, he was in a medically induced coma. He was 140 pounds soaking wet, hooked up to all these machines. And the only thing I knew to say is, God, if it's your will, take him. If it's your will to leave him, leave him. But if I had known what I know now, he'd be here. So, I knew I was gonna cry. 
So um, while we're down there, before he had passed, we're walking down the street, and I had the pastor beside me, and he's walking, and all of a sudden he's not there. And I turn and I look, and he's down on the ground praying for a lady that had a cane. And then he holds her cane, and she walks away. I thought, this is, there's something to this. You know, and then we go to a restaurant, and the, and the waitress had a, had a bandage on her arm, and he prayed for her, and then she left, and she came back, and she had taken it off. And I thought, this is, this is tremendous. So, um, like I said, my dad had passed. But during the time when we were cleaning out his little home that he was renting there, uh, there were some teachings. And one of them was the DHT. And it was a crude DHT because it was sort of translated haphazardly into Spanish and then back to English. And it was just, but that's what I had. So I brought it home. And in April of 2015, I think it would be, uh, I sat down a couple of days after we got home and I started going through this book. And it hit me instantly. Everything I needed, everything I wanted, I had it already. And I didn't know that. And nobody told me. And I lived like that for so long with so much guilt and condemnation and all this stuff. And then within a couple, it's anybody who would listen to me, I phoned them. I phoned my cousins, I phoned my wife, I phoned my mom, I phoned everybody and say, listen, this, this is what God has done for us. And we went down to Mexico because I told my dad on his deathbed that I would continue the legacy he created. And I started laying hands on people and seeing people healed. And this stuff was working. You know, there was a lady that couldn't produce tears for three years, and she was taking these pills. So she's, will you pray for me? So we, we, and I don't speak Spanish, and they don't speak English, you know, but God speaks every language, right? <laughs> so I lay hands on her, and we move on to somebody else, and then she's producing tears. We went and preached to the cartel, like literally the cartel members um, in rehab centers and stuff. Some of these guys would come up to me and ask me if it was wrong to kill people, you know? And, and so God had it in me now to, to always had it in me, but to set these people free. And we were setting people free left, right, and center. And then we, we brought it back to Canada and we started our, our home church, but I didn't know Curry. I didn't know life teams. I didn't know anything. I just knew God said, you need to start a church. So we started a life team in our church three years ago, or in our home three years ago. Um, and now it is a life team, but it, then it was just, you know, Marty and Bridges house. You know, it was just a church, and people were coming and learning, learning the truth, and learning to walk this out. And we took people on the streets that had never been on the streets before. And we, we go through, and we see people healed, and see people set free as we walk through the streets wherever we go, and we do this. But the biggest thing was that the condemnation, the guilt, the shame, and all this stuff went away. And God said, this whole time you've been waiting for me, but it is I who have been waiting for you. And this, that the, set me free. And now we're involved with JGLM, and we're going to take this message across the world, not just in Canada, but across the world, because I am free, I am whole, God is in me, and this is our life. I don't want to do anything else. I don't think anything else. This is what we do, and this message works, because I didn't have anybody to train me. I had a, I had a crude book, and then found some, some videos, you know, and started going through the stuff, and then really started pursuing it. So pursue this. Pursue this with everything that you are because we have to set people free. Jesus paid the price to set people free. And not only from sickness and disease and all that, but from, from almost more importantly to me is the religious bondage because that's what I suffered from. I didn't suffer from sickness and disease. I suffered from this. And my whole goal is to set people free because week after week, people tell lies about God. He's not this mean bipolar guy. You know, he's not looking to hurt you. He's for you. He is not the author of your pain. He's not the author of your misery. He's the author of your freedom. So Amen. we have to proclaim that around the world. And this message works because we just, I, I read something and we did it and it worked and we've been doing it for three and a half years. Go into it headlong. Don't ever give up. Keep going. No matter if you see healing immediately or not, keep going. I wish I was operating at 100%. But I'm not, but I will be, you know? I haven't raised anybody from the dead yet because I haven't come across a dead guy. But I will, right? It'll happen. But this message works. And, and I honor God and I want to honor this man because he's given us life for this. And I want to be part of this for the rest of my life. It works. Trust it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, brother. And last night when I was referring to 
people that were doing this that we had never met. I never laid hands on them. They just got the message, started doing it, started working. I was looking at Marty and Bridget sitting there and they were the ones on my mind when I was speaking because that's exactly what they did. And then after they started doing it and seeing it work, then we got to meet at conferences and things like that. And so, and now we're working with them up in Canada. And so, but that's, when I refer to that, I always, when I tell stories, I always have somebody in mind that I'm relating the story to. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> there was one other person. Where's our pastor? Where are you? There you are. Okay. If you want to come on up. <clears throat> last night, this is actually, I just met this brother last night. And he gave me some testimonies of things that I didn't know was going on, but I just wanted him to share some of those testimonies and the things that he shared with me last night. Uh, my name's Angel. This is my wife, Diana. We came in from California. We pastor two churches, one in the city of Modesto and downtown Modesto, right in the heart, um, just right off of West Modesto, which is the roughest area there. At the same time, we just planted a house church in our home about three and a half months ago. Um, man, it's a long story, but I'll condense it down really quick. You give a mic to a preacher and it just, <laughs> bad news. But <laughs> I'll, I'll just share with you really quick. I've been doing, uh, I got saved when I was 12, been doing ministry for about two years. I would go into the parks from ages 12, 13, 14 preaching the gospel to people, shooting heroin in Gleason Park in the middle of Stockton, going under freeways, um, going to the emergency rooms in the county hospitals, seeing just crazy things that, Lord, that the Lord would do. At the age of 14, I walked away from the Lord. Got very violent, selling drugs, just a lot of different things there in the Central Valley outside the Bay Area. There's a lot of bad things you can find yourself doing. Gave my life, came back, gave my life back to the Lord at the age of 19, got in full-time ministry for the next almost 10 years and traveled Central America, South America, Mexico, Caribbean, preaching through the United States, English, Spanish, and everything else. But uh, as we were doing ministry and pursuing ministry, we forgot a very important fact, and that was to pursue righteousness in Christ. Got caught in ministry, forgot about Jesus. We almost lost our marriage. We were at the point of divorce 10 years ago. And just to, on this point, thank God that we've been married 18 years. God did not give us back what we had before. He gave us a brand new redeemed marriage. And since that point, we took about four years, did nothing other than being dad and husband. And started getting back involved in ministry, everything else. My brother was locked in prison, came out. Uh, would preach the gospel to my brother. He gets saved. He's coming out. He pastors a church. He's planted a church in his, in his basement. So he's doing ministry. Me and my wife are doing ministry in a different city. Then we go to East San Jose and we're pastoring there for a year. My brother gets sick. At that time, some of you might know a gentleman by the name of Pete Cabrera. Pete Cabrera ends up getting in contact with my brother. Uh, he's been watching his videos, sends him over there to do the identity school. That's how all that got introduced. Me and my brother are sitting down. I'm a seminary student. I went to Bible college, went to seminary, all of those things, but grew up in a Pentecostal church my whole life. Took that, and we started going through and debating, and then finally my brother says, I can't answer your questions, but I think somebody might be able to answer your questions, and he turned me over to the DHT. At that point in time, I just went through it probably about three or four different times. Brother Blake, I, I took notes. I argued with you, and you didn't even know it. And went through that for a while, and about four years ago, it started, kick, it started kicking in. It started clicking. At that point in time, I'm just going to share with you what's been happening the last 90 days. The last 90 days, at the beginning of this year, we closed our, I'm a, I'm a, I was a licensed contractor, closed our business down. Felt like the Lord said, you know what, this is time to go in head first and let's do this full time. Pastoring a church in Modesto, we were getting ready to plant our house church. We started walking the streets, went to um, Santa Rosa when the fires hit in Northern California, just started walking the streets. Me and my wife laying hands on the sick, said, what would it look like if Paul went into a city and just started walking into a place where he knew nobody? 
We've seen a woman come out of a wheelchair. We've seen a demon-possessed woman get, get set free right there while police are arresting someone in front of the Red Cross, and the Red Cross is telling us, hurry up and leave because you're out of the way. You're not packing boxes. But we're setting people free right there in the middle of the street. At that point in time, it just began to just get crazy in the Lord. And we just started kind of doing this, just going, you know what? This is really fun. So we just started going for it. The last 90, about 90 days ago, I get a phone call from a gentleman through Facebook who's been watching our teachings and everything because we've got about four or 5,000 followers on Facebook and YouTube and everything else or our ministry. Contacted us and said, I need you to preach in Pakistan through Skype. I've never done that before. I said, sure, I'll do that. We pack in, we raise the funds. We have about seven, 700 people through Skype in the country of Pakistan in one of the most overrun cities by ISIS. These people are putting their lives on the line as I'm preaching in the comfort of my living room through Skype. In the middle of the sermon, I could hear the siren in the hour of prayer, the time of Muslim prayer. They lower the volume. I'm still preaching. We're still moving forward with this. We have a quick altar time, prayer time, and for 15 minutes, I got to see through sky one after another of people that got healed and delivered. Just one after another, giving testimony, shoulders, backs, necks, feet, legs, um, just all kinds of different things. Two women come up on the platform through Skype, get set free. Demons are cast out through Skype on the platform as we're sitting here doing this. The most amazing thing happened three days later that I didn't know because the Holy Spirit spoke to me in the middle as I was preaching in the altar time and said, somebody has a tumor. His name is Rafa Ked. I said, Pastor Rafa Ked, call out, announce, does somebody have a tumor in the crowd? He calls out and nobody, nobody announces anything. Okay, three days later, he calls me on Monday and says, brother, you ain't gonna believe what happened. I said, well, what would happen? He said, in Pakistan, Catholics and Pentecostals do not befriend each other. If you're a Pentecostal and you go into a Catholic church in Pakistan, they will literally hose down the inside of the church because you walked in there. But there was a, a, a Pentecostal who was li listening outside the building who befriended a neighbor who was a Catholic and invited him over because he knew they were having a service right by his home. Now, these are block homes, so there's not, it's not American homes. Sound travels very easily without roofs. They're sitting there. He's, he's sitting there in front of, in the side of his house, and they're listening to this sermon. And then the call goes out, does somebody have a tumor? The gentleman who was Catholic has a tumor the size of a softball that falls off of the side of his neck right then and there. The gentleman receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, gets, goes to church and gets baptized that same evening, comes to Christ, and his whole family comes to Jesus that day. This is happening through Skype. It's crazy. You know, I know Jesus said lay hands on the sick, but he even said to speak it through Skype. Greater work shall we do. So this, that started everything we've been going through. Last weekend, we were in San Diego preaching the gospel, went to Chicano Park, laying hands on, on people just in the middle of the street. We're going and preaching in downtown San Diego. Several people get healed, delivered. We go have lunch. The waiter gets healed. He's tripping out. We go back to the pastor's house, and from 5 o'clock in the, in the evening till, till midnight, we had people coming through this pastor's house, getting healed, getting delivered, getting set free, getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the living room for seven hours. That was last weekend, and then this week was just incredible. Our, everyone told me when you start a house church, man, there's going to be times when it's just you and your wife and your kids. I don't know what that's been like because three and a half months, we've had... 15, 20, 25 people there getting healed, saved, delivered, set free on a consistent basis. And I just want to say Jesus is absolutely incredible. And to all of you, the, the, I wanted to, sh I wish, I, I, was, I told my wife, I said, man, I wanted, I wanted to say something in the middle of the service, but <laughs> I said, I don't know if the Curry Blake with his karate is probably going to take me down or something. <laughs> but for everyone here, if you've never operated in the gifts or you've never you, you know, in, in that mindset, you've never seen somebody get healed. I just want to say this to you, to take the burden of responsibility, or not the burden of responsibility, but the weight of responsibility is on our shoulders to move. But let me share this with you. One of the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 3 and 3 that you mentioned that hit me the hardest was that. Why do you still think as mere men? 
Why do you still think of yourself as mere men? And let me say this. When you're out there in the streets and you're feeling the unction of the Holy Spirit to speak a word or lay hands on somebody, understand that it is reconciliation, the heart of God that is moving through you. That even if you say the wrong thing, I love the fact that Joshua prayed and said, sun stand still, moon stay in its place. You know that physically that that is incorrect. But God understood the heart of Joshua to still do the will of God. So when you go out there, be willing to make a mistake and just be willing to look stupid for the glory of God. Because you will find yourself seeing amazing things. Do not be afraid to let him be glorious through you. Amen? Thank you. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to give these brothers a chance to share what was going on because what their testimonies just completely encapsulate everything we've been saying these last few days. That the real key is just get started. Just, just go and get started. Uh, Jesus, one of the things that John Lake said that I really appreciated is he said, Jesus, or he said God actually, he said, God does not work independently of you. He works through you. But for him to work through you, you actually have to step out. And that's why the enemy works so hard to try to convince people <clears throat> that anybody that is doing something, they, they're special, they got a special gift or something. And yet if you ask any person who is doing the works of Jesus, if they're special, if they're honest, they will tell you, no. And they will tell you, if God will use me, he will use you. That's what they all say. And every ministry that talks about healings and miracles, and, and especially I'm, I'm talking about like Wigglesworth and John Lake and all these different people, the reason they share those things that God is doing through them is they want to inspire you to do them too. It's not so you will go ooh and ah and leave and talk about their testimonies. I never share a testimony so you'll go off and talk about me or my testimony. I share testimonies so you'll go off and get your own. But you should know that you can do this. So, <clears throat> I wanted to share a couple of things this morning. I'll try to make it fairly quick here. Let me get all my stuff out. There we go. <clears throat> now, we've been talking a lot about spirit, soul, and body. <clears throat> because once you understand that and the truth of it, everything does start to work in you. You know, all of these people that, that, that you've heard today, both the men you've heard today, but even people like Pete Cabrera that my brother mentioned a minute ago, uh, Pete got a hold of the DHT years back and he directs people to it. And also, uh, different people throughout. Todd White also got a hold of the DHT. It's where he got started, actually putting the things into place. So the people, basically the people that, that you know for doing the works of Christ on the streets, almost all of them came through the DHT. But the, the thing about it is this. All the DHT does is strip away all of the religious trappings. It strips away the the, the, the unnecessary and just leaves the essential which is the word of God whenever Jesus went to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house you know she comes to him and she says Lord tell my sister to help me she's, she's doing nothing and I'm doing all the work and Jesus' answer is amazing he says you're, you're encumbered with a lot of different things he said but she has chosen that one thing that is needful to hear the word. The word is the one thing needful. And so if we can strip everything else away, Jesus said, because of your traditions, you make the word of God of none effect. And so if we can strip away the traditions of men to where it's only the word of God that's left, it works. And even, I know different people that, that hear the, the DHT and they go through it and, and many times they say, well, you know, it took a little while for it to start. In that little while, it's, it's not that God is holding back saying, I'm going to see if you're serious. 
What's actually happening is it's taken a little while for those sacred cows to die and to get out of the way so that you're no longer in doubt and unbelief. That's essentially what it is. Because as soon as you believe, it works. So the key is to get that stuff out, but most people don't take the time to really get all those things out of the way. Now, <clears throat> this morning, I'm going to share a couple of things, and we're going to look at a few scriptures. I'm not going to keep you long, but I do want to go along these lines, because if you look at it, spirit, soul, and body, well, then you have the word, right? And then you have, okay, <clears throat> the spirit <clears throat> would relate to the word. Okay, because my words are spirit and life. <clears throat> the, the soul relates to the person, you yourself. But now, the, the body is the physical you. Okay, but now notice the key of this is that God didn't make you just a spirit. He didn't make you just a body. He didn't make you just a soul. He made you spirit, soul, and body. So these three things, these three components combined make you one. That's who you are. <clears throat> now, a lot of people, well, I, I don't want to jump ahead too quickly, <clears throat> but a lot of people think that the Spirit of God more or less kind of is wispy and can't be pinpointed and kind of hovers around them or if he's in them, if they go so far as to believe that he's in them like the Bible says that he dwells in us, that he's just in there like a passenger in a car. You know, he's, you know, you turn a car and the person will do this, you know, or as you turn too quick, to the, and that's not it. He is one with you. So when you move, he moves, right? It's not like you move and then he catches up. As you move, he moves. Let me put it this way. You ever watch a, like a champion um, dance team? A couple. You ever see a couple? I mean, I'm talking a champion, right? I mean, these people have won, uh, you know, dance uh, championships, you know, like whatever dances, you know, whatever dance they do. <clears throat> but you watch them. What makes them, and you might not even recognize it, but what makes them look so good is how in sync they are. That they move as one. You've got two different people moving as one. That's what, because if they don't do that, even if the people don't recognize it, it won't be appealing. It won't, you won't look at them and go, wow, they're really good. When they're really good, it's because they move in sync perfectly with one another. That's the Holy Spirit in you. And the problem is most people don't think that they can ever be in sync with it. They think they're always wandering around and every now and then you kind of collide and every now and then he'll say, okay, do this. And you go, oh, okay, do that. That's not how it is. That he's in sync with you. You're in sync with him. You move, he moves. You don't move, he can't move. Why? Because he dwells in you. So if you don't reach out your hand, he can't touch them. If you don't speak that word to them, he can't touch them. He moves with you and at least not through you. He might be able to do it through somebody else, but... He moves with you. You're one together. This was really the message that John Lake started preaching that he caught so much flack for. But once you start to realize that, then you realize even if you make a mistake, guess what? God's big enough to fix it. But if you don't do anything, God can't fix that. It'd be better to, to do something and make a mistake than to do nothing for fear of making a mistake. Because if you, at least if you make a mistake, he can fix it, right? We always say that, right? He can turn things around. He can cause things to work together for the good. You know, we always misquote that scripture and throw it in whenever we don't know what we're doing. And so, but now, I taught a seminar several years ago on, called Apostolic Alignment. And in it, I talked about the fivefold ministry and how the fivefold ministry is actually what they're supposed to be doing. And in that, you know, you have the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And in this fivefold ministry, many, the way we, because of how we've been taught as a church, because of, like Marty was saying, the religious bondage that the church has been under, we think that if a prophet comes in 
He's supposed to come in, do all this amazing stuff, and then leave. And all we can do is get the blessing that he gives us when he speaks to us or gives us a word or something. And when he's gone, boom, it stops and there you go. You know, we just have to wait till he comes back again. And because of that understanding or that misunderstanding, it has caused the body of Christ, it's caused the, the growth of the body of Christ to be stunted to where they've never really moved into anything. And they're always waiting for the guy to show up. And when in reality, the fivefold ministry is to perfect the church, is to grow them up, is to edify them, is to train, to equip them. So if a prophet, let's say a prophet comes in and they minister prophetically. Now, just because you have to think of this as like two tuning forks. Now, we've got the same tuning fork in us called the Holy Spirit. And whenever you get around someone whose tuning fork is vibrating, when you get around them, if you have the same frequency tuning fork, you don't even have to hit it to make it vibrate. You can take a vibrating tuning fork, get it near the other one of the same frequency, and it'll start vibrating. That's what the fivefold ministry is supposed to be. When they come in and they teach and they display the Spirit, demonstrate the Spirit, we could say, when that is happening, we're not just supposed to sit there and go, ooh, ah, oh, isn't he something? Wow, I'd love to be like that. Guess what? You are like that, right? Now, just because you, he ministers and you see him, you may not be a prophet. Let's, let's say he's a prophet. You may not be a prophet, but you can take from him the DNA of a prophet and function prophetically. But that doesn't make you a prophet. So you can actually start to function prophetically. There are people that I get around that are prophets. And when I get around them, the prophetic DNA starts to stir up. Now, if I would keep it stirred up whenever we part ways, I could keep functioning that way. But a lot of times I don't, and I'll see it gradually decrease. And then it's like, I want to get around them again because I want to get that stirred up again, right? And so... You can get around people. Now, the key is this. The fivefold ministry, if you, okay, Jesus was, was the apostle, right? He was the prophet. He was an evangelist, came with good news, right? He was a, what? A pastor, the great shepherd, and he was a teacher, rabbi. He was all five, right? Now, now we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Each one comes in with a part of the DNA of Jesus, so when they come in, that's why the church needs the fivefold ministry coming in so that we can glean from the DNA of each office. And if we glean from the DNA of each office, then we become a full rounded Christian like Christ. You get that? And you'll start, you get around an apostle, guess what? You're going to go. That's just the way it is. Why? Because the apostolic ministry is a go ministry. It has a go mentality. It has a take ground for Jesus. That it's, it's the, the most militant ministry. And honestly, most people don't even understand that and they see it because the, the apostolic ministry or the ministry of an apostle is going to be so militant and so aggressive because they answer to one commander and they don't care what people think. All they're trying to do is please their commander. And the Bible is very clear. It says to endure hardness as a good soldier. It says any man that goes to war doesn't get entangled in the affairs of life. Why? So that he can please the one that called him. See? And the, but the apostolic ministry is the most militant ministry. And that's why a lot of people say, well, I don't feel love or I don't sense love. Well, no, not the way you've been taught love, but you've been taught love wrong. What you think is love is not love. What you think is love is mostly just sympathy. And, and you want somebody to, to coddle you or to make you feel better. And that's not necessarily love. Love is being able to diagnose a problem and tell you the truth and then fix it. Jesus said, and gave us the best definition of love. He said, greater love has no man than he that lays his life down for a friend. Now, how do you feel someone laying their life down? See, it has nothing to do with feeling. Love isn't a feeling. Love is a commitment. Love is, is laying your life down for somebody else. Is laying your life down for people that really has no way of repaying you for it. And so that is 
first and foremost, part of the apostolic ministry. And so you can glean that. Now, receiving from an apostolic ministry doesn't make you an apostle. But you will have the apostolic DNA that will be in you. Gleaning from, the, from a prophet doesn't make you a prophet. It makes you prophetic. And so you will start to function prophetically. Same thing with the evangelist. But see, as every Christian ought to have at least all five of these DNAs operating in them. When they do, now they're becoming a perfect man. They're coming into the fullness of what Jesus was. <clears throat> so it's not about, well, that's not my ministry. No, it's all your ministry. It, all you're telling me is you haven't practiced that enough for it to become natural to you. Amen? Because we all have to grow up. Now, <clears throat> watch this. Because I want to move into the spirit, soul, and body. I really want to talk a little bit more about that this morning. Because people think, like I said, that the Holy Spirit is just floating around in you. And if you move too quick, he'll bounce into that side and then come back in. You know, it's just like he's just floating around in there. He's not. You have to realize, your spirit does not float around in you. Okay? Now, we know that the Bible is very clear. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about getting born again. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit being in you. Right? Now, the Holy Spirit is not this little cloud that sits in your belly. Okay? He, said, he didn't say that's where the Holy Spirit was. He said out of your belly. Okay? Now, for you to be alive, your spirit, your human spirit, has to fill your entire body. Right? So my spirit has the same shape of my body. <clears throat> Any place that my spirit is not filling my body, that part of my body would start to die instantly. If you take my spirit completely out of my body, my body will drop dead because it's the spirit that gives my body life. So, any, and so if I could somehow spiritually grab my finger and cut off the flow of spirit, and there'd be spirit everywhere else but in that finger, that finger would start to physically die because it's the spirit that gives life. So if I could cut off that flow. Now this is, a, in essence, what sickness is. Sickness is when the enemy cuts off the flow of spirit into your physical body. He gets in there and he stops that and that part of the body starts to die and it, and it starts to be corrupted, Right? Now, so your body fills you completely. But now think of this. And because, I, I, man, I went into this and I'm praying and I'm looking at these things. I'm going through scripture. I'm asking God questions. And I said, for my spirit to keep my body alive, it doesn't just, my spirit isn't just in me. My spirit, has, there has to be, and it's, this is hard to explain, but for my spirit to keep my body alive, my spirit at some place has to actually make contact with my body. Right? It has to make contact. There has to be a contact. See, most people don't think of it. They think it just has to be in there. But it has to actually make contact. Now, in, in, and there are other religions, you might say, that have stumbled on to some spiritual truths and part of that, matter of fact, if you look at any of the Eastern religions, uh, there is something, especially in the Japanese understanding, uh, which has to do, you know, with Buddhism, things like that. And they say that about two inches below your navel is the seat of the spirit or the seat of the soul, they even say. So you take your navel and you go about two inches and right there is where your spirit abides, right? Which is kind of funny because that's your belly and out of your belly will flow rivers of water. So it's amazing how they stumbled onto some truth, right? But now notice it doesn't say that's where your spirit is. It says out of your belly will flow. So that's not where it is, that's where it comes out. You got that? Now, but the way it comes out, it doesn't mean it comes out this way. It comes out of the center of you and flows out. So when I lay hands on people, it flows through out of my belly, through my arm, and into them. All right? I'm just, I know this is a little different maybe, but I want you to get a hold of it, right? Because if you get this, this will help you uh, practically, okay? So <clears throat> this, your spirit is in touch with your body. 
the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in and just sit. He comes in, and everywhere your spirit is, he fills your spirit with himself. So now you've got your body, then you've got your spirit, then you've got his spirit in there. And everywhere, if you see my body, that's the shape of my spirit. Since you know that's the shape of my spirit, I can also tell you that's the shape of the Holy Spirit in me. Because he fills my entire spirit, right? So, now, in the Japanese, uh, this was called Dantin, which is the, the center there. Now, and, and again, it doesn't, you know, it's just matter, it's just, they found truth, or at least a bit of it there. So, out of this, now, science now, let's go to the other extreme. <clears throat> now, science has discovered this little bitty organ, like a gland, actually, it's a gland. It's about the si actually about the size of my, the end of my little finger. Little bitty thing called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland sits almost in the direct center of the brain, right? And the thing what they found out is this. There's this molecule that the pineal gland produces. But it has to be, uh, how can I say, um, stimulated. Yeah, that's it for it to produce this molecule. <clears throat> and what they did was, they actually took probes, went into the pineal gland, and stimulated it. And every time they did, these people would start having visions. Now think about that. And, and then all of a sudden, science says, see, there is no God, it's a part of a gland, and you stimulate it, and they have visions, and they see angels, and they see sometimes heaven, and sometimes they see demons, and all these different things. So, and they're saying, see, none of that's true because we can stimulate that and cause it, okay? Well, guess what? I can close my eyes and see nothing or I can open them and see stuff, right? Just because I close my eyes and don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. When I open my eyes and see it, I'm seeing what's there even, and I can know it's there even if I close my eyes. Does that make sense? So, for them to say, well, this, uh, you know, all these spiritual things aren't real, because we can stimulate it. Well, I can choose to open my eyes and see. And, but now think about this. If God is going to deal with us, okay, he speaks through the Spirit. He doesn't speak to our audible ears, right? He did in the Old Testament, in many cases, but that's because they were natural people and they were not uh, spiritual people, so he couldn't speak to them in the Spirit, per se. But now he speaks to us through our spirit, but there also has to, there has to be. We know now that there is a connection between our spirit, the Holy Spirit in our spirit, and the connection between that with our body. That there has to be that connection for there to be life. So instead of thinking of life of coming in and coming out of one spot, we have to think it more in terms of our, the shape of our spirit, and from our spirit, it's like, the best way I can explain it is like pixels on a television. You know, the television, you don't see just one picture. It's a bunch of pixels. And those pixels are all projecting light out of them. And so your spirit is like all pixels projecting light and life out of them. And that light and life that is coming out of them touches the body. And because of that body, it gives life to the body. Does this make sense so far? Okay, so that life is projecting straight out of wherever it is. It's going straight out into your body <clears throat> because of that. Now, because God made us spirit, soul, and body. See, a lot of people discount the body. And they go, oh, the body, I hate the body. I wish the body, you know, no, your body's important. It's part of you. Without a body, you're not you, right? Think about it this way. If your body isn't important, why is God going to glorify it? Why is he going to immortalize it? See, you're going to have a body the rest of your eternity, right? And God cares about your body so much that he is going to glorify your body just so that it can exist wherever you're going to exist, right? So your body is important. Now, but too often, and especially in some religions and different beliefs and different things like that, they try to put the body down and they try to say the body doesn't matter and the body is evil and the body is bad. No, the body is only bad if it's not been trained right. The body is neither good nor evil. It just has to be trained, right? And it will be trained according to your soul. Your body obeys your soul. 
That's what happens. Now, your body doesn't obey your spirit. Now, your conscience abides in your spirit, not in your soul necessarily. And it's part of it. And when we talk about the heart, we're talking about the complete who you are. The heart of man is where spirit, soul, and body all meet. And they all come together. And, it's the, and that's why God said, you know, to love you with all your heart. To love him with all your heart. Why? Because he wants every bit of you. Spirit, soul, body, mind, will, intellect, everything. Feelings, emotions, everything. Right? Now, because of that, you have this in you. You have the spirit. And now that spirit, that life is there. Now, going back to the pineal gland. There would have to be a way, because remember when God made man, Adam, in the garden, Adam was a physical being. He made him out of the dust of the earth. That's physical. So he made him physical, and then he breathed ruach, the, the breath of life, right? The spirit, he breathed that into him, and he became a living soul. Isn't that funny? We have, right there in the beginning, we have the body made out of dirt. Then God breathes spirit into him, and man becomes a living soul. Spirit, soul, and body, right there in the same place, right? And we have the word ruach. And because of that, now, when we talk about this ruach, in the Old Testament, it's ruach in Hebrew, and then in the New Testament, it's pneuma, which is also spirit, but it's also translated spirit, wind, breath, all of these are different translations of the same word, of, of actually both words. So now you have God breathing breath, spirit into man. He becomes a living soul. And the amazing thing is, he's got this. Now, well, what do we call that? Even the words we use today. If a person dies on their medical report, it doesn't say you know, when did they decease? It says, when did they expire? And, and I've heard people say, well, you know, there's no expiration date on you. Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, I, I can go along with that. But the, the term we use is expire. Now, the word spire comes from the word spirit. To expire means to have the spirit leave, to exit the spirit, for the spirit to exit. Guess what the opposite of that is? Inspire. So when you're inspired, the spirit comes in. So when a person is inspired, it means the spirit has come in and now they are inspired. So anytime the spirit is moving in you, you're inspired, not depressed, inspired. Why? Because God brings life. He brings light. He brings vitality. See, where you see God, you see life. You want to see a good example of life? Look at children. They're full of life. They're all over the place. They, they run, they play, they're happy. You know, and, and if they see you sad, they'll recognize it and they'll come over and try to make you happy. They won't come over and, and try to make you sadder. And they won't try to explain or understand why you're sad. They want you to be happy. Why? Because that is the heart of God in that child. So we can inspire or be inspirited or we can be expired and unfortunately, a lot of people expire way before they ever die. And, and that's called religion, usually. And so we need to realize that I'm, I'm trying to get you to a place where you see what this, how God created us as spirit, soul, and body, that we are to live in this natural world. I love what my brother said. Yes, that why do you think of yourself? Why do you still think of yourselves as mere mortal men? Mere natural men. Why? Paul was saying, that's not who you are. You're not a mere mortal man. Why would you act that way? Why would you act as though you can't do anything about that circumstance? You're not mere mortal men. We have become partakers of God's divine nature. Do you get that? God's divine nature. Whenever we put these things into place, these precious promises that he's given us, when we take these promises out of this book, put them in our mind, and, and, and start to put them through our body, when we start to live them out, we become partakers of God's nature. Do you realize that by what you do, you become a partaker of God's nature? You want more of God's nature? Do the promises. It's this simple. See, I can come at this a thousand different ways, and it's all going to say the same thing. 
when it comes down to it, at some point, you're going to have to act. You're going to have to have motion. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to do something different. If you want different, you got to do different. If you don't do different, you're going to keep having the same. That's just the way it is. God will not force himself on anybody. If he would do that, he would make everybody get saved. And if he's not going to do that, the most important thing, then he's not going to do that for any other thing. You, he wants you to be joined with him in your will. He wants you to decide to work with him as co-laborers together with him. And so this, he has filled him, he has filled us with himself. And then when we start to lay hands, now I want to move on to this because uh, we, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. Okay. Let me show you a couple of things here. Uh, go with me first to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews. Uh, well, you know what? First, no, let's go back. Let's go to Romans. Sorry about that. I know you're already headed toward Hebrews, but Romans, and we're going to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Now, the reason I'm sharing this, and we're going to go from here, we're going to go from Romans 2 to probably Romans 8, because I don't want to take too much time here. Romans 2, verse 15. Uh, go back, no, yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's go back to verse 11. Sorry about that. Romans 2, 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. Now, how many of you know that's good news? Right? Okay. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. You hear that? The doers of the law shall be justified. But of course, Paul is talking to Christians, right? So what that says is you can't do the law. Well, let's put it this way. If you could have done the law perfectly without Christ, you would have been justified. But you can't do the law perfectly without Christ. But now that you have Christ, you can actually do the law. Why? What is the heart of the law? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now that you have the Spirit of God in you, and the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost, you can love God, and you can love people. Right? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying you can do it. Right? Yeah. Pretty easy to love God. A little bit harder loving some people. Right? Now, and then he says, verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature... The things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. You hear that? So here he's saying that even the Gentiles who weren't under the law, you realize the Gentiles were never under the law, but they weren't under the law, but God still had a standard that they had to live up to. Why? Because God, the law didn't make the standard, the law revealed the standard. The standard was there before the law was ever spoken. Does that make sense? Now, it's just like the law of gravity. Even if you don't know, if you were a child, before you understood the physical law of gravity, how many of you know it was working? You didn't have to understand the law of gravity for it to work, right? And you experienced the law of gravity even before you knew there was a law of gravity, right? And it's the same thing. You were... There was a law, which was the standard of God, before you ever knew there was a law. Before you ever knew there were Ten Commandments or any of the rest of the, you know, law. There was already a law there. But the law was revealed to us to show us, you're not living by the law, so you need somebody to cover for you and take care of that, so that now you can be justified before God, and He can put His Spirit in you, and because of that, now you can actually live the law. Right? Now, when I say live the law, you realize Jesus lived the law. Right? He did not violate the law. What he did violate was the religious regulations that the Pharisees mistook for the law. And that's what most people have today. Most people today do not have the law of God, an understanding of the law of God. What they have is an understanding of the, or a misunderstanding of the regulations 
that religious people have made. That's why many religious people will look at somebody else and go, oh, they're a sinner. Well, why? Well, they're not living according to the, to the Bible. Really? What are they violating? What are they doing wrong? In other words, are they actually doing something wrong or are they just not practice religion like you do? Because it's funny, everybody will have a different understanding of what sin is and it's usually based on the group you're with. Right? And so, I don't have time to go into all that, but still. Now notice he says, they were a law unto themselves. Now look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So it says, even though they don't have a law, you can see that the law was written in their hearts. Even though they don't have it and they don't know it, they will do it automatically because it's written in their heart. Right? Then he says, their conscience. You hear that? There's that word conscience. I mentioned that earlier. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So now they got a conscience, but then they also got thoughts. But now the conscience, as I said earlier, the definition of the conscience is to become conscious. Once you become conscious of something, now that becomes your conscience. In other words, you know the difference between right and wrong. That is your conscience when you know the difference. So you're immediately responsible for whatever truth you know. It's just that simple. Now, notice this. Go with me to uh, Romans chapter 9. Yeah. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, very quickly. And then we're going to go to Romans 8, back to 8. Romans 9, and I want to look at, what do I want to look at? Uh, you know what? Let's start in, yeah, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. In other words, my consciousness of what I know to be right and wrong is bearing witness in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one that brings remembrance all truth. Right? So now, then he says, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why? Because he, he in his consciousness, he knew right and wrong. And that became his conscience, right? Now, <clears throat> go with me to Romans 8. Romans 8. Now, I've talked about a little bit, and this is the part that will hopefully help you, okay? That as far as becoming practical. Because this is, this is probably the two biggest questions I get is this. Number one, how do I pray for, and you fill in the blank. That's the number one question I get above everything else. But the second thing I get, people say, I've heard you talk about this, but how do I actually do this? You say, what is this? How do I actually release the spirit out of my spirit into my flesh? Right? Because when I lay hands on the sick, that's what I'm doing. I am releasing the spirit out of my spirit into their flesh. You get that? Why? Because that spirit is what heals their flesh. Now, technically, it's going... Uh, and, and even if they're not born again, it is still the Spirit going into them and then coming out into their flesh. But the real key to this is this. Let me go back to it. The, if you've seen the book, I wrote a book, I guess a couple of years ago now, but it's called uh, Healing for Everyone. And in it, I go through Mark chapter 4, partially, and I show that there are four kinds of people. Mark 4 talks about the four different kinds of soil. And Jesus, it's, everybody calls it the parable of the sower. It's not the parable of the sower. It's the parable of the soil, right? Because it talks more about the soil than it does the sower. The sower just spread the same seed on four different kinds of soil. And then he explains the different kinds of soil. So the important part there is twofold. Number one, the same seed was sown in all types of soil. But of the four types of soil, three produce nothing. Fall away, listen to it, receive it with joy. But when persecution comes, they fall away, whatever it is, and they fall away. So the three types of the soil, 75% produce nothing. Now, this is, now get this. This is 75% of people who have received the seed. 75% of people who hear the word of God produce no fruit. Think about that. That's 75% of the so-called Christians. We're not even talking about people out in the world. We're talking about 75% of the church produces nothing. 
25% produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. So out of the 25%, now there are three categories within the fourth category. And those three categories include 30, 60, or 100 fold producers. Do you get that? So that narrows it down quite a bit. Now, the amazing thing to me is this. In, in, in the world has stumbled onto this a little bit. Their numbers are slightly off. Because in every endeavor, you look at anything, business, every, you name it, any area, they will tell you there is this thing called the 80-20 rule. Right? 80% do nothing, and you know, 80%, basically, they say 80% produces 20%, and the 20% produces the 80%. Right? That's what they say. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to disagree with them. It's not the 80-20 rule. It's the 25-75 rule because I'm going to believe Jesus. Right? Now, in business, not dealing with the Word of God, okay, maybe they're right, 80-20. But when it comes to people in general, 75% of Christians are not going to produce anything, and 25% are going to produce one of three categories, basically. And I'm not saying that you always either produce 30, 60, or 100. I think there could be areas in there where you produce more or less in it, but I think Jesus was using those as examples to say, look, there are degrees of fruitfulness in the kingdom. But now you notice the 25% the that produces the 30, 60, or 100 fold God is not responsible for their producing fruit. You get that? The soil is responsible for producing fruit. The same seed was sown to everybody in the 25%. So the 30, 60, or 100 fold is based on the, the word that the soil, how the, how the soil receives the word and produces out of it. In other words, the, as we'd say, the 25% receives the, the word of God and due to their, their uh, how can I say, it? their efforts, their actions, whatever you want to call it, then they're going to produce 30, 60, or 100 fold. God is, and, and what they're doing is they are sowing and what they sow, they reap. So God's not in charge of their reaping because he's not in charge of their sowing. So the person is in charge of their own sowing. So if you want to produce 30%, then okay, so 30%. Right? You understand what I'm saying there? I'm not saying it's an exact back, but I'm saying that whatever you sow, you're going to reap back. To the degree, to the, to the measure that you sow, you're going to receive back. So a 30% uh, you know, reaping, as opposed to 100% reaping, means that the person that reaps 30% did not sow what a person who sowed 100% sowed. Does that make sense? Right? Now... Again, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is I want to show you really how to release the Spirit into your flesh. So, we're talking about the four types of soil. So now these four types of soil, the fourth one is the one that produces. Now, <clears throat> in, we've already mentioned these words, inspire. To inspire means to have the Spirit come in. To expire means to have the Spirit go out. Now, when you, when I lay hands on someone, like I said, the Spirit, now get this. I'm going to use these terms. That I've never used it like this before, but I'm going to go ahead and use them. When I spend time with God, I, and, and when I walk with God, and I commune with God, and I fellowship with God, when I'm doing that, I am inspiring myself. Right? Because I'm communicating with him. And now, but now when I minister, I'm expiring. That makes sense? Because I am releasing the spirit out. The spirit is going out. So don't think of expire meaning to die necessarily, like I was talking about earlier. But it means, so the fellowshipping with him, building yourselves up in, in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. This is a way you could say you inspire. But really what you're doing is what Tim, uh, Paul told Timothy. Stir up the gift that's in you. Now, what gift was that? Because he wasn't talking about a gift of healing. He wasn't talking about a gift of prophecy. He was talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, stir up that gift in you. Okay, so now you say, well, wait, isn't the Holy Ghost always on? Yeah, he's always on. But to get stirred up, you actually have to stir him up in the sense that what you're doing is you're like 
Tom said yesterday, is we're, we're shaking you up, right? And in that process, we're shaking him up because he's ready to go. But that as you begin to uh, stir yourself up praying in the Holy Ghost, and you say, how, how do you do that? Well, you can pray in the Spirit. I'll tell you another way you can stir up the gift and how you can stir up yourself, right? Because remember, whatever you do with him, you're doing with you. Whatever you do with you, you're doing with him. Why? Because you are one. Don't divide what God has joined together, right? Wigglesworth said it this way. I may start in the flesh, but I'll end up in the spirit, right? He said, if the spirit doesn't move me, I move the spirit. Now think about that. That's almost, you know, blasphemous in some circles, but what he's saying is, all I have to do is get started. Now, how do, if, I, if I'm going to start in the flesh and end up in the spirit, how am I going to do that? That means I have to step out. But it also means I have to stir myself up. So how do I stir myself up? Because if I can stir myself up, I can stir up the gift that's in me. Right? Because as I stir myself up, because we're one, I'm stirring him up. So how do I stir him up? How do I stir up my soul? Peter said... I'm, I'm, it's not grievous for me to write these things to you again because I'm writing these to you so that I may put your most holy uh, faith, or actually he said your, your, your mind, uh, in, in remembrance. Now think about it, that I can stir up your holy remembrance. So Peter said, as I share these things with you, I can stir you up as you receive these words of the Spirit. So one of the fastest ways to stir yourself up and stir up the Holy Spirit in you, guess what? Start talking about the things the Holy Spirit's done. You start talking about the things Jesus, well ago when our brother was talking, and both our brothers were talking about testimonies, things they started seeing, the things that started happening. Guess what? The Holy Spirit in you is getting stirred up. Why? And whenever he got stirred up, guess who else got stirred up? You did. Now, but did you get stirred up first or did he get stirred up first? Oh, let me tell you the answer. Who cares? <laughs> See, that's our problem. We think too much. And we try to think through this stuff. And, well, is this me or is it the Holy Spirit? Who cares if it's right? You're one. Jesus never did that. Well, bro, uh, you know, when the centurion came to him and said, my servant lies uh, at home sick of the palsy. Jesus didn't say, boy, you know, uh, officer, I'd really like to come. I personally would love to come. But you know, the Holy Spirit, I, I'm not, just not sure. I, you know, let me, let me confer with him and let's do it because I would really love to do that. But I'm just not sure. You never see that in Jesus. When he spoke, the Holy Spirit was speaking. Why? Because they were one. Now, the Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord. Now, let me, let me just ask you, how many of you are joined to the Lord? Well, guess what? You are one spirit with the Lord. You get that? What that means is you get stirred up, you stir him up. You know, it's, it's like, you know, many times in situations, especially if you're married, you know, uh, if you get up before your spouse or whatever, you get out of bed, guess what? They might not want to wake up, but they're probably going to wake up. Why? Because you're moving around, right? Or turn on a light or, you know, getting out of bed or whatever it is. And all of a sudden they're awake. Why? Because you moved, you moved. And guess what? They moved, right? One. Maybe not always unintentionally, right? But it's the, it's the same thing. I was teaching on something along these lines one time, and I had a friend of mine there, and I said, you know, when you've been married, uh, and, you know, congratulations on the 18 years. That's awesome. That is, uh, that's always good, you know, uh, to see what God has done. And, but when you, if you've been married any length of time, <clears throat> I said, you know, you can start a sentence, and your spouse can finish it, right? And my friend called out. He said, yeah, it's called Interruption. Okay, so, maybe, okay, but, but the bottom line is, why? Because you know, you know, you start telling a story, your spouse will finish it. Why? Because they know the story. They were there, they, in many cases. And so they, you know, you just, you flow together and it's, it should be seamless. And Paul said, listen, I want to talk to you. Uh, about husbands and wives and doing, and then he says, but you know, of course, I, I, when I'm speaking about this, I'm actually speaking about Jesus and the church. He said, I'm giving you a, a natural example of a husband and wife being one, but the only reason I'm using that as an analogy or an example is because I'm trying to get across to you how the church and Jesus are one. But see, the church has never emphasized that. If anything, the church has emphasized the separation between him and us. 
And it's almost blasphemous to say we are one. But Jesus said, I and my father are one. And he said, Father, I pray for these that they may be one with us as we are one, that we may all be one. And the whole point is that hey, that's what he came to do is he came to join himself to us, to give us union with himself. So now we have to realize, you know, you say, well, where does the Holy Spirit pick up and I let off? Well, number one, I don't want to know, right? I want this to be seamless. I want to live constantly in the flow. You know, you, you take a bucket of mud and you pour it into a river, guess what? It doesn't just float down the river in the shape of a bucket. It disseminates, it dissipates into the entire river and it, and it goes into the entire river and now the river has something in it that it wasn't there before. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, he doesn't just sit in one little spot over here in the corner and you know, mind his own business. He permeates, saturates every bit of you. Now, when you realize that, now here's what you can do. You can, usually the first step, and, and this, is, this goes counterintuitive to everything we think, generally speaking. Usually, you will have better results praying for other people, and you can't even get yourself healed. You ever notice that? It's easier to pray for somebody and get them healed sometimes than it is to pray and get yourself healed. Well, that's part of the reason why we need the body. I can pray for them, and they can pray for me, and that's, that's part of the body. Now, but we are to be partakers of what we give, so we should be able to receive for ourselves also. But if you ever notice, and this is one of the big questions people always have for me, well, how can I go out and lay hands on a sick if I'm not healed? But you see, it's easier to get them healed than it is for you to get yourself healed sometimes. Why? Very simple. You know you too well, and you don't know them. And you may think, you wouldn't say it, but there's some level of you that still thinks that God loves them more than you because you know you well enough to, if you were God, you wouldn't love you as much as you would love them. That's only because you don't know them, right? If you knew them, like you knew you, you'd say they don't deserve it either. <laughs> Amen? See, everybody's just messed up. And we all go to church hoping that somebody there has it together so they can help us. Right? And the, the real truth is, we're all just coming together. And, and the sad part is, instead of going in there, all realizing, yes, nobody has it together. But guess what we got? We got Jesus. And he's the one that does it. And even in our mess ups, even in our failures, he is there. Amen? And he will use us and, and bless others. And, and the thing is, okay, let's say you need healing. Well, oh, I can't go minister sick because I need healing. No, it's a little thing called sowing and reaping. You need healing, go sow healing. And when you sow healing, you will reap healing. Right? You get that? So you keep sowing, you keep reaping. And the more you sow, okay, we talk about the 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now I know it sounds like, and, and I would agree, the idea there is that there are people that produce 30, some produce 60, and some 100 fold. I agree with that. But do you realize that everybody that produces 30 doesn't have to stay at 30? You can start at 30 but you could actually move up to producing a hundredfold, right? You don't have to stay where you are. You can grow. Why? Because you're supposed to grow up to be like Jesus. Jesus was definitely a producer of a hundredfold, right? And he was always giving out healing, so he didn't need to be healed because he was constantly sowing, so he was constantly reaping. So he was constantly giving life out. So he's constantly receiving life. He had life. Why? Because Jesus lived by the same rules we do. He, he lived by the same rules. He lived by the same, uh, well, rules. That's the best word for it. He did what he taught. And he told people to do that. So he did that. That's the way he lived. If Jesus didn't live by his own rules, he was a hypocrite. He wasn't a hypocrite, so he lived by his own rules. He did to others as he would have them do to him. That's what he did. He just went about doing good, healing all the oppressed of the devil. Why? Because that's what he would have wanted somebody to do for him. Why? Because you say, how do you know that? Because that's the rules that he laid down. And if he didn't live by them, he was a hypocrite. So he obviously lived by them. Now, notice this. So in this, and I wanted to, yeah, I don't have a lot of notes here, just a little thing with scriptures, basically. <clears throat> but I wanted to take you also, yeah, we're in Romans 8. That's where I'm going. Okay. That's where I want to go. Romans 8. 
Now, we, talked about, we were talking about the four types of soil. <clears throat> the first type of soil would be, in this world, would be the unsaved, right? Most, maybe you've heard me talk about this before. Now, ha, has God made a way for unsaved people to be healed? Yes. Mark 16. Believers lay hands on the sick. And he, he said that in the context of the great commission of people going out and preaching to unbelievers and then demonstrating the kingdom so that these people would see the reality of it and get saved. So unsaved people can be healed when saved people lay hands on them. Un, when it says believers lay hands on the sick, he wasn't talking about believers laying hands on sick believers. He was talking about believers laying hands on sick unbelievers and in the course of that they become believers. So God has made a way for unbelievers to be healed. That's the first category. Second category, right, would be the brand new. Now, you got somebody saved. I mean, they're so new, new that if you said the word carnal, they wouldn't even know what carnal is. And you go, yeah, you're carnal. Well, okay, what is carnal? Is that, is that good or bad? What is that? Right? Well, has God made a way for the brand new baby Christian, brand new, for them to get healed? Yes, James chapter 5. 13 and 14. That's, that's, he made that way. How? If you're sick and you're a believer and you don't know how to get your own healing, call for an elder. They will come. They will lay hands or as we would say, they will anoint you with oil and they will pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith shall save, heal the sick. You, you, do you hear any if in there? You ever notice the only if in that passage is if there is any among you that's sick. You hear that? There's no if about the prayer of faith. No if. Anytime you put in if, you put in doubt. So there's no if in the prayer of faith. Like, like you know, what we were talking earlier, like Marty was talking about, Lord, if it be thy will, you know, take him or leave him, you know, if whatever your will is. Okay, but there's no faith in that. But isn't it amazing that God can often, even though there's not a necessary faith, God sees our heart? And he knows the intention. Amen? But now, it's better to know the prayer of faith because somebody needs to have faith. So, whenever you have this person now, they're a brand new believer. Not, you know, we wouldn't even call them baby. Okay? And they're so new. Then, the next category, and that's James chapter 5, the next category would be a carnal believer. And the carnal believer, has God made a way for the carnal believer to get healed? Yep. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What is that? He says, when you come together, you break bread, you do this. And he says, through communion, for the first three to 400 years of the church, there was no healing service for believers. No healing service for believers. Believers were healed as they participated in communion. They would break the bread and they would say, this is his body broken for me meaning by his stripes I'm healed, and they would eat the bread because they're carnal. Carnal means sense-oriented, so they had to have a physical thing. They had to have something, and as they took, they said, now, as I eat this, this is my physical understanding that as I do this, the healing wasn't in the bread. The healing was in the fact that they knew that when I ate that, that's when I was accepting it. So that was how they released their faith. <clears throat> and he said that this, because you don't know, because you don't discern the body, he wasn't talking about the body of Christ. He was talking about phys Jesus' physical body, not the church. And he said, because you don't discern the body, many of you are sick, weak, and die prematurely. Why? Because you, you're eating the bread and you don't know why you're eating it. You understand the juice. You get that. That's the blood of Jesus on the cross. By his, you know, and, I, and because of his uh, sacrifice, I'm saved and my sins are forgiven. You got Why are we eating the bread? I don't know. We just, you know we're just eating bread. And he said, you're not discerning the body. His body was broken for you. And by his stripes, you were healed. And if you ate that bread with that understanding and then drank that juice, now your sins were forgiven and your body would be healed. So people were healed during communion. Carnal believers needed that physical thing to get healed. So God has made a way for the third category of carnal believers. So what's the next category? Spiritual believers. Spiritually minded. You can be carnally minded or spiritually minded. To be spiritually minded, okay, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, right? <clears throat> so how does a spiritually minded Christian receive healing, all right? Well, let's go back to the carnally minded for a second. 
carnally minded, he says, if you are carnally minded, to be carnally minded is death. What does that mean? As long as you think carnally, death is working in your body. But when you speak, or whenever you think, I should say, spiritually, then death is not necessarily working in your body, but now life and peace is working in your body. <clears throat> so to be spiritually minded, number one, you, if you're spiritually minded, you're going to have life in you, which means you're also going to have life coming out of you, because out, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. So you're going to speak life. You're not going to speak death. You're not going to speak disease. And therefore, death and sickness and disease, that kind of stuff, doesn't have a, a working in you. And you'll start to realize, as soon as you change your mouth, you will start to experience a whole lot less sickness and disease. Why? Because the devil has to trap you in your words and get you to think something and get you to say it so that he can bring it to pass in your life. So if you just change your words to speak life and peace and blessing and health and strength, 80 to 90% of the problems that you experience physically will, will disappear. Just from that, because the enemy has no place. Right? Which is what they tell us to do. Give the enemy no place. Give the devil no place, no ground. Don't give him anything in you. Jesus said, the wicked one comes and has nothing in me. So now you change your mouth, you start speaking life, and when you do that, and I see carnally minded people, you, one of the fastest ways to tell whether a person is carnal or spiritual is listen to them talk. Fastest way. When you hear them talk, you can tell real quick by what they say, whether they are carnally minded or spiritually minded. If they speak death and sickness and disease and blood and us and, death, and it's all of that, guess what? Carnally minded. End of story. No, there's no way you can be spiritually minded and speak carnally. Do you get that? But now, if you listen to them speak and they're speaking life and health and, and, and hope and, and faith and joy and peace and all these things, guess what? They're probably spiritually minded. Chances are pretty good that they're spiritually minded. So now you've got a spiritually minded person. Now, here's the thing. Most spiritually minded people don't need healing because they've already changed their mouth and they're actually walking in divine health. But every now and then, they may need healing. When that takes place, how does a spiritually minded person receive healing? Well, God's already provided for the other three categories. Let's see how he provided for it for the spiritually minded person. Look at Romans chapter 8. Now watch this. He says, uh, you know what, let's just we're gonna start in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You hear that? People always quote that. They say, well, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Finish the sentence. To those that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You hear that? Now, then he says, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That, now notice he condemned sin. What does that mean? In the flesh. Because Jesus lived a life without sin. So therefore he proved that sin did not have to be performed. Right? Then he said, why? Verse 4, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. You hear that? The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. Who? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you're walking, at, if you're walking after the flesh, you are not fulfilling the righteousness of the law. But if you're walking after the spirit, you are fulfilling the righteousness of the law. Do you hear that? That's good news. Now, people always say, well, you know, we, we, we just can't fulfill the law. We can't do any of that. Really? What, what part? Because all the law is wrapped up in loving God and loving your fellow man. Can you do that? Yeah. Do you always do that? No. But can you always do that? Yeah. You can. You just don't. It's not that you can't. It's that you won't. Right? Let's get, let's get this settled. Right? Now, watch. Then it says, in verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, I'm going to say something. A lot of people, sometimes they take offense. But almost every person that's ever said anything to me about it, the reason they took offense was because they had a loved one die 
and they didn't want to accept the truth that that loved one was carnally minded, not spiritually minded, right? But notice, I will make this statement. No spiritually minded Christian has ever died of sickness or disease. Amen? Any Christian who has ever died of sickness or disease was not spiritually minded, but carnally minded. Why? Because to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Then if we're spiritually minded, how are we going to die? Okay? Really? That's what you got to worry about? That, that, <laughs> people, well, how am I going to die if, I, if, if, if it's not through sickness or disease? All right. How about just live? How about that? Let's just go that way, all right? Okay? Now, but now notice this. <clears throat> what that means is this. How does a spiritually minded Christian die? The same way Abraham died. The same way uh, different people throughout history. I give you a lot of different names, different people I know of. I didn't know them personally, but I know their family members. And whenever they, it, and the Bible is very clear. It says that whenever a person, when a saint dies, the Lord takes their spirit. And so you just lay down when it's time for you to go. 70, 80, 120, whatever you, okay. Psalm, 90, Psalm 91 says, with long life. Will I satisfy them, right? Now, if you're satisfied at 70, fine, go. If you're satisfied at 80, okay, go. You're not satisfied till 120, live to 120 and then go, right? But he'll satisfy you. So when, that's what Wigglesworth said. He said, when I'm satisfied, I'll go. And he went at, what, 87, 88 years old. And so we realize that how do saints, spiritually minded saints die? The way they're supposed to die is they are ready to go. They call their family together. They bless them. They part all of their goods to them. That way there's no fighting after they're dead over somebody's will. And you give to each one what you want to give to them. And you bless them. And then you commit your spirit to God. And your spirit leaves your body. And your body is dead. That's just waiting. You just, but to you, it looked, to the people around you, it looks like you just go to sleep. Hence the term, many of you sleep in 1 Corinthians 11, means dead, right? And so, because technically a true, a Christian born again never dies. Why? Because the real you is your spirit. Your spirit's not going to die, right? So from now on, it's just life. Now your body may lay down and die, or it may last till Jesus comes. Great. Either way, doesn't matter. Who cares, right? Bottom line is, if you're born again, your spirit's right, you're good. Now... So in that, how does this work, okay? My, my grandmother, okay, let, let me go back here. Um, if you die spiritually, well, let me say it right. If you're spiritually minded and you die, you don't die of sickness or disease. You just go to sleep. Your spirit leaves your body and your body just stops working. <clears throat> my grandmother was 90 293, I think it was. Went right through there. My, uh, my mother, actually me and my mother went down to see her. Uh, my grandfather had already passed away several years before that. Uh, he was also very old, elderly also. And so we go down, we visit with her. Now, before we leave, my, and my mom actually told my grandma, because my grandma said, you know, I'm just tired. I don't want to be here. She was in a, in a nursing home. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm just tired. I just, I just want to, I just want to go on. My mom said, "What? Well, you know, mom, uh, you, we can pray with you and you can commit your spirit to God and you can just go to sleep and just go. You don't have to stay here. And my, my grandmother said, really, how, how do I do that? And my mom said, well, we just commit your spirit. So here's what we, we'll pray. And so she prayed with her and then I left and, and I actually, I'd already left at that point. And my mom went back home, which was about three hours away. When she got home, the answering machine, it was a landline, the answering machine was on, and my mom listened to the call, and it was the nursing home, said, uh, would you give us a call? And my mother knew exactly what that meant. And so she called them, and when they answered, my mom told them, said, uh, she's gone, isn't she? And they said, yeah, right after y'all left. She committed her spirit and just went to sleep. Easiest thing. Now, here's the thing. See, medical science will come in, and they'll analyze the body. And they're going to go, oh, look, they died of a heart attack. Okay, well, let's, let's analyze that for a second. What does that mean? 
uh, what, the, what medical science sees is the heart froze up. Well, guess what? When you take the spirit out of somebody and the heart no longer has life in it, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to freeze up. It's going to stop. It's like taking all the oil out of a car. That, that oil, that, that engine is going to freeze up, right? And, but now, it, they didn't die of the... See, that what they're doing is they're mistaking the result of the spirit leaving as the cause of the spirit leaving. They think they had a heart attack and they died. Their heart quit working and then their spirit left. No, their spirit left, so their heart quit working. You get that? So that's, so that's why science will never verify that a person just, well, went to sleep. You know what they say? Natural causes. Right? Well, let's call it not natural, but let's say in many cases spiritual causes. But you get to choose that. You can choose. Right? Even Paul talked about this, and he talked about it in Hebrews, that some people uh, re refused the deliverance when they were being persecuted. Why? They refused. Now, you can't refuse deliverance if it wasn't offered. See, you can't choose. But they said they refused deliverance, choosing to die as a martyr so that they could receive a greater resurrection. But that means they had the choice. And that's what we see that in Paul's life. Paul said, listen, I'm, 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 I'm kind of in a twix between two. You know, part of me wants to go, but part of me wants to stay. Part, you know, for me to, he said for me to, 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 to die is gain, but to live is Christ. In other words, if I die, that'd be great for me. But if I live, I'm going to display Christ. I'm going to, uh, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm going to live the Christ life, as we would say. So I'm going to live that life. But Paul is saying, uh, he, he was chained. There was guards around him. And he said, um, you know, I can't, really, I can't really tell right now if, if I want to go. I really would like to go. But, you know, actually he said, but it's better for the church that I stay. So I'm not going to go right now. He was dictating whether, the, the, whether they were going to execute him or not. And if you go and check, after that he was released. And then later he was arrested again. And then he said, my life is already being poured out. I'm done. I'm finished. I've poured out everything I've got. I'm ready to go. And then they did kill him. They couldn't kill him until he agreed. Think about that, right? The, the, the um, historical tradition says that the apostle John, they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil and they couldn't even kill him. So then they just exile him to the Isle of Patmos. Well, why couldn't they kill him? He wasn't ready to go and he hadn't written the book of Revelation yet. Right? Which we needed. Right? Not to scare us because the Antichrist is coming. But we needed the book of the Revelation to show and demonstrate to us the final victory of Jesus over all of his enemies. That's the purpose. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we need to see the good and we need to see the end of the story and not all the stuff and always talking about all the other stuff going on in there. Right? So, now, yeah, I, mean, I guess I need to quit here pretty quick. Should have already quit. We'll just combine both, both sessions. Y'all good so far? Okay, okay. It's Sunday. You're not used to getting out before noon anyway, right? So we're good. So. Now, so he says here, Look at this, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity or hostile toward God, for it is not subject to the law of God. You hear that? Isn't that amazing? This fascinates me. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. That's what makes it carnal. If it was subject to the law of God, it wouldn't be carnal, it would be spiritual. Why? Because the law is spiritual, Paul said. Right? If you don't know these scriptures, you can look them up. Just, I'm actually quoting more from King James so you can actually find them in a concordance. But notice, it says, For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. And, but isn't it funny that everybody you see that tries to live according to the law by rules and regulations, they're all carnal. And yet the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God. And yet they spend all their time trying to be subject to the law of God and they can't do it and they always stay in failure, which is why they're always depressed and, and have condemnation and all this. But, and, but, it's, but the spiritually minded person, now get this, the spiritually minded person is not concerned with do's and don'ts. But they live the do's. 
And when you live the do's, you don't have to be concerned with the don'ts. You should be so busy doing the do's, you don't have time to do the don'ts. Amen? Do you see that? If you get a hold of this, it changes, it makes life easy. You say, you say are you, Curry, you saying you don't believe in sin? Oh yeah, I, do, I, I believe in the fact that it exists. I believe in the fact that there are times when I do sin. But I also believe stronger in the truth that if I sin, I'm not going to spend six months trying to somehow pay penance. I'm gonna, as soon as I recognize it, I'm going to, you know, if I have fallen down while I'm on my knees, before I get up, I'm going to be right with God. I'm not going to walk around six months, oh, oh, I messed up, oh, I missed it. Oh, no, I'm going to believe that if I confess my sin to him, he is righteous and just to cleanse me and to restore me to fellowship with God and to put me right back where I was. I don't have to go back 10 steps and rewalk it. Wherever I fell, that's where I get up and keep on walking. I don't go back. I get up and keep running. And the best way to prove that you believe that you were forgiven is act forgiven. Go heal the sick. Get out there and preach the gospel. Get out there and lay hands on somebody. It proves you believe the truth of the word that you were forgiven. You're not ignoring it. You're not treating it as though it's nothing. You're believing the word of God. And you're moving forward in the things of God. Now, but notice, it's always the carnal mind that tries to be subject to the law, and it's an impossibility. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. The carnal mind cannot obey the law of God. That's why it's so important that we walk in the Spirit and become spiritually minded. Right? Now watch. He goes on. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In the flesh. What does that mean? Carnally minded. Okay? Because the word carnal means, it's like, almost like the Spanish, carne meat flesh meat to be flesh to, to uh, they that are in the flesh they that are in the carne cannot please God they that are carnal cannot please God that's what he's talking about but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit when when I feel wispy when I you know when I when I feel something no watch but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you you hear that you're in the spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you, meaning that if He dwells in you and is influencing you to do the things of the Spirit, which is the things of the Bible, then you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Then He says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So again, you either are or you ain't. Right? You don't grow into being a Christian. You become a Christian. You're a new creation. You become that. Now I'm not saying you're always function like that because your head still has to be, you know, your mind still has to be renewed. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, you don't pay attention to it. You're not carnally minded. The carnally minded is always paying attention to the body. You, here's a, a good way that you can always tell carnal minded people. Oh man, this hurts, that hurts, my back hurts, my leg hurts, my body hurts. They're, they're always focused on their body. Always. If you're focused on your body, you are carnally minded because you are flesh minded. Okay? Now, he says, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. In other words, you don't pay any attention to it and you believe the word of God and you act on the word of God and it's true. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit, now here it is, watch this, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, now, who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, we have two different, several different scriptures. One, some scriptures say that God raised Jesus from the dead. True. Some scriptures say that Jesus was raised by the Holy Spirit. True. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is also God? So both statements are true, right? You also hear that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of God. Well, the glory of God is the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, the glory of God is present. What does that mean? Now, if you think glory is a cloud or a light or smoke or fog or something like that, that's not what we're talking about. The Bible says that man is the glory of God, right? But it says that the glory of God, showing that the Holy Spirit you raised Jesus from the dead, is that the Holy Spirit is also the glory of God. And so, well, matter of fact, you can even go in further. Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? What did they see? Lazarus come back from the dead. What was that? They saw the work of God. So the work of God is the glory of God. 
Amen, you get that? The glory of God is not just a cloud, it's not something. Now in the Old Testament, they had to have that, why? Because they were carnally minded, they were fleshly minded, they had to see something, feel something. They had to have a, a sensory experience. And that's another way you can tell spiritual or carnal Christians. If you have to have a sensory experience to believe that God did something, you are carnally minded. But if you can have a spiritual experience, meaning you read it in the Bible, the Bible says it, you decide to believe it, regardless of what your physical senses say, you are a spiritual minded Christian. Isn't that simple? So you can tell right where you are at any time based on what you're paying attention to. If you're paying attention to the Word of God and what it says, you're spiritually minded. If you're paying attention to your body and what it says, you're carnally minded. End of story. I'm not putting you down if you're carnally minded. It's good to know where you are so you can grow. Amen? And so it's not a, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying don't stay there. Don't stay carnally minded. Why? Because to be carnally minded is death and I don't want that in you. I want you to grow and be spiritually minded because there's life and peace. And here's the other thing you can tell how people are, whether they're carnal or whether they're spiritual. The one thing that Jesus, well, one of the things, the, the main thing that Jesus said he left us, he said, I give you peace, my peace, not the peace the world has. What is the peace the world has? The world has peace when there's no conflict or problems. Jesus said, I don't give you that kind of peace. I give you peace that is always abiding in you, which means even in the midst of problems, you have the peace right? He said, my peace I give you. So that's how we can also know because to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So if you see a person who doesn't have peace, they're not spiritually minded. Do you get that? To be spiritually minded is to have life and peace. And yet most of the Christians I meet honestly don't walk in peace. They're, they're, they're in turmoil. They're, you know, and it usually has to do with their body. Something's going on in their body. Well, you know, I know the Bible says I'm healed by stripes, but, you know, I'm just, I've been fighting this thing, and I, I just don't know what to do. And they're in turmoil. They're carnally minded, right? And it's not, I'm not trying to just detail that, but I'm trying to say, let's move from this. Because here, now watch this. We'll move on into it. But if the Spirit of Him, the Spirit of God, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. So if you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, right? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. Now, the word quicken means to make alive, change, and even to heal. Okay? He shall also quicken, make alive, heal your mortal bodies. You hear that? He will heal your mortal body, not your immortal body. This isn't talking about your immortality at some point. This is talking about you right now. He said, if you have the Spirit of God in you, God will heal you by His Spirit dwelling in you. Now, this is another key to find out whether you are spiritually minded or physically or carnal minded. A spiritual minded person knows how to re receive Spirit and receive healing from the Spirit of God that dwells in them, and they don't have to get it through communion. It's okay to do it that way, but they don't have to. And they don't, or they don't have to receive it through laying on of hands of another person, either elders, James chapter 5, or believers, Mark 16. A spiritually minded person knows, a spiritual Christian would say, knows how to receive directly from God, and he knows how to have this. Because, listen, if I lay hands on you, there is nothing this hand can do in and of itself. The only reason this hand is of any use is because of the Spirit of God that's in it. So if you get healed, it's because the Spirit of God in this hand got to you, right? Well, if you already have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then all you have to do is learn how to receive from the Spirit that's in you, and you won't have to receive from the Spirit that's in me, because we got the same Spirit. Amen? And once you receive that, see, okay, think about this. I'm known all over the world as, you know, a healing guy, right? People bring people to me from all over the world for me to pray for. Here's the question. Who would I go to if I needed healing? Yeah. Amen? You see what I'm saying? I, I'm not, I, who am I going to go to? If everybody comes to me, who am I going to go to? I can't go to anybody. There's really, because if I can release it to you, then I can release it to me. Why would I need to go to somebody? If I need to go to somebody, then how are they getting healed by coming to me? Does that make sense? So I had to learn how to release life the Spirit of God, out of my spirit. His spirit is in my spirit. And I had to learn how to really release His spirit out of my spirit and into my flesh so that I could receive healing for myself because there was nobody for me to go to. 
Amen? So, man, early on, I went to people just like anybody else had. People lay hands on me, different things. But I also knew if people were going to come to me, I couldn't very well tell them, okay, yeah, come to me. But the way I get healed is by going to so, so and so. No. So what I did was I realized I had to receive it for myself so that I could give it to you so that I don't tell you to do this or do that. I can give it to you. But now I'm trying to take you beyond that so that you realize that technically you don't need my hands because you already have in you what I have that's going to heal you anyway. And once you realize that you already have in you what will heal you and you learn how to release it. Now, I have already told you how to release it, but now I'm also going to tell you a... a a method, for lack of a better term, an exercise, okay? So here's how you do it. Now, notice, let me finish reading this. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. How are you going to get your mortal body healed? By his spirit that dwells in you. You hear that? That's a spiritually minded Christian. Now, he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Right? So that he's talking about living by the Spirit. So he's not talking about just about healing. He's saying this Spirit that's in you that will heal your body will also guide and direct you and will also help you live the life and mortify the deeds of the flesh. As you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will need healing less and less. Why? Because it's the deeds of the flesh that generally bring on the sickness anyway, or at least open the doors, we would say, to let the enemy try to get in somehow. Now, so, in finishing, <clears throat> how do we do that? How do we release the spirit out of, our out of our spirit into our flesh? Well, first off, let's say, how do we release the spirit of God out of our spirit into somebody else's flesh? Because if we can know that, then we can backtrack and we can kind of reverse engineer it, right? And figure out how to do it for ourselves. So what am I doing? And if you'll notice, and, and, and a lot of these things, nobody taught me this stuff. Uh, you know, I didn't go to somebody and there was no diagrams in any of Dr. Lake's material or anything that said, here's what you do. And when we first started, I would lay hands on people in, you, you know, typical traditional church. I laid hands on their head. And so I'd put my hand on their head and because that's what, how we were taught, you know, just to lay hands. And as I did that, then as the numbers of people got more and more, and I ended up being in prayer lines for two and three and four and six hours, and I was doing this all night to each person, because we pray for everybody, and then, the next, then I'd go home, or go back to the hotel, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, I couldn't move my arm. Why? Because I did this all night, right? And my arm was sore from just putting in that position. And I said, there's got to be something else. And so I started searching the scriptures about what Jesus did and how, what the, how the disciples did. And every time it mentions them laying hands, sometimes it says he laid hands on them. Sometimes it says that he laid hands on them, and it says that he did it this way. In Acts chapter 3, it says that Peter took the man by the right hand and lifted him up. That's laying on of hands. And many times it talks about how with the right hand they did something. That's not about special about the right hand necessarily, but it was what they did. So then I started realizing that I could actually tell people, let me see your hands. Why? Because it's a law. It's the law of contact and transmission. All right, what do they call it? Um, I'm trying to remember what the, the word for it. Um, convection, whatever, no, what is the other thing? Anyway, but where you take a hold of somebody and you're connecting. Because you're connecting, there's a transference, right? And so I would take them by the hand. I said, okay, let me see your hands. And I just took them by the hand and I started noticing I'd stand close and I'd stand like this. And I would start to feel, literally felt, a flow. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I felt that. But then I realized that I felt it because it was here and would come here. And I would feel it good up to this point. And from here, it was like there was less. Seriously, I could feel more going to this point, And then it would be like less. And then I realized that my hands, I always say they're like jumper cables. You know, you, to, to jump a car. But then I realized it's not really like jumper cables as much as it is like a garden hose. Because you take a garden hose and you bend it. What happens? The flow is going to the bend. But once you get to the bend, less water comes out. And as I bent my arms, less flowed. Now, I know this sounds crazy. But, and then I started stepping back. And as I stepped back and I unbent my arms, I could feel the flow go out. That's when they felt it. And all of a sudden it's like, bam. And they would get healed. And I started realizing 
He said, living water, rivers of water will flow out of your belly, which is where they were flowing out of, and they flowed into these people. And the more, the straighter my arms were, the easier it flowed. And you say, but it doesn't make sense. No, we are spiritual, soulish, physical beings. One, all together. And so I started doing it that way. And many times I would even cause them to stretch their hands out because sometimes their hands would be like that. And I'm like, no, I want a straight flow. I know this sounds very, you know, natural in many ways. But we've proven it. I've experimented with it. We, we, we've proven it. And so we started doing this. Now, for me to do that, the way I taught people to transfer the spirit of God from yourself to them was, and I explained it this morning, inspire, okay, and expire. To expire means to breathe out, right? And so it was like I would lift something and I would hand it over. And to, in my way of thinking, it was almost like an arc, you know, the, an arch, put it that way, an arch. And so it's kind of like I would pick something up and I'd go here. And it's the same motion. It's kind of like you breathe in and you just breathe out. And it's just like, you see how you do that? I, what am I, I'm handing it up. You have a baby in your hand, you hand off the baby. And at that time, you're, you're passing it to them. And it's the same thing with the Spirit of God. I'm expiring. I'm breathe. It's not that I'm breathing, but the Spirit of God, the pneuma in me is going out into them. But I'm, I'm choosing when that happens. So when I hold their hands, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm purposely deciding now. And when I decide now, that's when it's done. All right? Now, to go for, now if I can do that with people, in the beginning for me, and you can practice all these steps. In the beginning, the way I started was I did the same thing with myself. If I needed healing somewhere, I would lay hands on the part of the body that needed healing. And so I would just lay hands and I would purposely, I understand it's a closed circuit, all right? I understand that. But it was like I would release out of my spirit into my flesh, wherever, the, wherever I had the need, right? And it was the same thing. I decided now. As, but I learned to do it as, I didn't put hands and then go, okay, now. No, I did it the same way I take people's hands, now. As soon as I touch, now. And I decided, now. And I would release right then. And I saw healing in my own body. But then I started realizing I can do this without doing it. Because then I started studying spirit, soul, and body. In the beginning, I saw the spirit as in one area. Out of your belly flows that. But then when I saw that the spirit, my spirit covered my entire body. And his spirit was in my spirit. So his spirit is in every part of my body. Then I realized that even though he's flowing out of my belly, so to speak out of the innermost being is the way it's to be. It, when it comes out of the spirit, it's actually going from the spirit directly into the flesh. So I learned to just decide to let it directly out of my flesh where, for instance, let's, let's just make up something. Um, let's say I had a, a bruise, okay? Let's say I had a bruise on my arm. Then the way I would fix that, I wouldn't lay hands on it. I did in the beginning. But the way I would fix that now, I would notice, oh, I got a, I got a bruise there, okay? So now I'm going to choose to let the spirit out of my, his spirit out of my spirit, which is in my arm, and I'm going to let his spirit go directly into that part of my flesh. And when I do, that bruise will be healed. Does that make sense? Now, see, we're, we're, the problem with this is a lot of people go, okay, this is too uh, mechanical. It's too... You know, you, you're detailing it, you know. We shouldn't be able to do that. It should just be God. Well, I can give you that simple answer of, yeah, we just believe and it happens. But that's not good enough for you. You want details. You want to know how it works. That's what people, how does this work? Well, that's what I asked God, and he started showing me. So that's why I'm sharing it. Then I went back and realized what, what I found was that actually John Lake taught this. He taught this in Spokane. He taught it here in, in Portland. And what he called, the, what we call the divine healing technician training, Okay, we're training divine healing technicians. But what he called it was he taught lectures in his healing rooms on the science of divine healing. See, there's a science to divine healing. Science is the knowledge or the understanding of how God does things. That's all science is, okay? Theology is the, the, the ology on it 
is the science part. Biology, right? All the zoology, all these different things. They're, the ology part is the science. Right? And, and, and when you have biology, it's the understanding or the science of how the bio works. Well, theology is the understanding of how God works. That's all there is to it. So when we give you the science of divine healing, it's going to be mechanical because it is reproducible. Why is it reproducible? I read the scripture to you earlier. God is not a respecter of persons. He does everything for everybody the same way. Now, the, how it is expressed may be differently. But he's doing the same thing. Everything he does is by the Spirit. It, it is always spirit. It is always life. It is always light. It is always love. Now, how that light, life, and love manifest, that light, life, and love can manifest in words of knowledge, word of wisdom, uh, gift of healing, uh, working of miracles. Those are all expressions of the Spirit of God, which is light, life, and love. Are, does that make sense? Now, the, the things that I'm teaching you here, the reason I'm teaching is because I've never been able to teach them anywhere before. Not like this. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share this, to, you know, this week here with you because we've been building this point because what I really want to get across to you is this and I will close on this point. For the church to grow, we have to stop being like the Israelites in the wilderness. The Israelites in the wilderness wandered around 40 years a distance that should have taken them less than two weeks. But they had to wander around until that generation died that had stood before Moses and said, we cannot take that ground. And Moses said, and God through Moses, they said, okay, here you go. You will wander around, you will never see it, but your kids will see it. And guess who saw it? The only two out of the 12 that actually saw it was Joshua and Caleb. The only two that said, we are well able. Now notice, those two also had to travel around 40 years waiting for those other 10 to die. There are people that are causing the church not to experience the fullness of what God has because they don't believe they can move into it. Now the beauty of that is, Moses and his group, they were all in one area. The beauty of it is, and, and even you can see it in church today, you know, if you leave a church, sometimes people go, oh, that's, oh they're, they're, they left God. No, they just left that church, that, that group. But we are blessed to be in a place now where we can choose who we're going to fellowship with. You can choose. And I will tell you, who you associate with will be the number one determining uh, factor in your spiritual growth. If you're going to hang around dead people who always say they can't, you're going to end up dying and never can. That's the way it is. He said, well, I'm staying here so I can change them. You're not going to change them. You witness to them, whatever, but you do it from a distance. Hang around people that are full of life, full of people who are going, we can do this. God said we can do it. We're going to do it. Find those people. Associate with those people. Let me tell you, I would, I've said it before. I would rather be around a positive sinner than a negative saint. Because I, I can turn the sinner around. All they got to do is see the work of God, right? But a negative saint, as, as Albert Einstein said, be careful of some people because they have a problem for every solution, <laughs> right? We need to make sure we're not that, amen? But there is a generation arising, and we get to choose. Do we want to hear this truth? This truth was preached 85 years ago. But because the church wasn't ready at that time, guess what? They had to go around another 40 years. 40 years later, guess what happened? The church wasn't ready for it. You know, in the 1940s, there was a major move. It was called the Manifested Sons of God. It was called the Latter Rain. And they were moving in this direction, but they got off track. And they got into trying to be somebody rather than trying to serve and showing that God is working through everybody. And because of that, they got off track. Guess what happened? They went around another 40 years. <clears throat> About every generation this comes out again. This is that time. Now we get to decide, are we gonna move in this? Or are we gonna move, are we gonna go around the wilderness another 40 years? 
is there going to be another generation that's going to have to take a hold of our inheritance and we're going to be, you know, maybe watching them from heaven or whatever, but are we going to move into this or are we going to wait for somebody else to pick it up and run with it? Now, I've already made a commitment. I'm not going to let this die again. And so that's why I'm sharing it the way I am. Amen? So, and now this is, this is exactly why we're here. Why? Because we have good, solid people here that are committed to this message and they are committed to helping people grow. But we're not just saying, well, just do anything you want because that doesn't work. There's a process, a biblical process of mind renewal. There's a biblical process of learning who you are in Christ. The Bible is very clear about it. You may have been told, well, God just does whatever he wants to do. That's not true. God is bound by his own word. He said, I will not change the thing that's going out of my mouth. So God has, has bound himself within the confines of his own word. And what we do, he tells us to walk in this word. And that's why here in Portland, we have the church. We have Dominion Life right here with Vito and Zach and all the team. And which, by the way, I meant to say earlier, God bless you and thank you for setting all this up. Because I'm telling you, you're going to, I'm telling you, amen. It's a lot of work, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to pay off. Amen. And we've already been talking about it. And, and depending, basically, I guess we could ask you. We're talking about doing this at least once a year, every year, coming back in here and doing this again. Amen? And, 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 and we're, of course, now I come in other times also, and we're going to bolster the church up here, and we're going to help plant life teams and work with you and all that. But we want to use this as a time to gather the people together and train in mass and then send you back out and help you grow this in your area too. Because we're committed to this. It's not just about preaching, it's about effectiveness and actually getting the job done. So, to release the spirit out of your spirit, it's, it's so simple. Let me ask you this. I'll tell you this first. Everything in the Bible, everything that's our inheritance, everything you get from God, you get the same way. There are not, God has not prescribed different ways necessarily for you to have to receive. He's made ways for you at whatever level. I'm talking about healing and everything else. But the way you operate in the kingdom is the way you got in the kingdom. You get that? The way you got in is the way you function. How did you get in? By faith. You found out it was the will of God for you to be saved. You found out that the grace of God opened the door for you to get in. You accepted that grace and you decided to act upon it, make Jesus Lord, and you got into the kingdom. And the minute you got in the kingdom, the kingdom got into you. Right? So the way you get in the kingdom, by faith. Now, notice, you didn't by faith just sit around and go, well, you know, I'm exercising my faith and if God wants to save me, he can. I'll give him permission. And guess what? You do that, you won't get saved. There had to come a point that you made a decision to get to say, I make Jesus my Lord. Right now, I decide to believe the Word of God, and I'm going to do what it says. I'm going to confess Him as my Lord, and I'm going to obey Him. I'm going to become His disciple. And you made that decision, and the minute you made that decision, you got born again. Right? But that, now notice, you were saved by faith, but that faith culminated in a point in time where you made a decision. Am I right? Because if you hadn't made that decision, you ain't saved. It's just that simple. You're not going to get into the kingdom by osmosis. You know, by you just hanging around Christian people that are in the kingdom. You get in the kingdom even if you hang around them. And that's the real danger is people hang around Christians, they start acting like Christians, and they never get born again. They wonder why they still got the same problems they had when they were in the world. Well, it's because you're still in the world. You're just hanging around Christians. And the fact is, you have to actually get born again. You have to make that decision by faith at a point in time. This is it. And now I receive and now I'm born again. Boom. There you go. Now, that's how you get in the kingdom. That's how you operate in the kingdom. That's how you get healed. That's how you get everything that God has promised. You follow that same pattern. You find out the will of God. You decide the grace of God has provided it. And you decide to step into it. And you go, this is that moment. It's mine. Amen? That covers everything God has provided. Now, that also covers how you release the spirit out of your spirit into your flesh. How hard... Now, understand, how hard was it 
for you to make that decision. Now, I'm not talking about the struggle up to of giving control over to God. That might have been a struggle for you. But I'm saying, when you got ready to make that decision, how hard was it to make the decision? You just simply go, I'm done with this. I receive, I believe it, done. Right now. Isn't that right? It was that easy. You didn't have to struggle, oh, I'm trying to believe, I'm saved, I'm trying to believe. Now, it may have been harder for other people to believe you were saved. Right? If they were watching you. But for you, you got to a point where you go, no, it's done. I'm saved. I know it. I know it. You can't convince me or not. I know it. Right? It wasn't hard to make that decision. It's the same thing with releasing the Spirit out of your spirit into your flesh. You make the decision by faith at a point in time. See, if you don't, you have faith, but if you don't make that faith culminate at a point in time, you're not truly in faith, you're in hope. Hope leads you to a point where you act in faith. Faith is an action. It's a decision. It's making a thing. It's settling it. Most people never settle it. They're still kind of wondering. You know, wandering and wondering. No. So, the, it's the same thing. You have to decide. Right now, matter of fact, let's just do this, right? If there's sickness or disease in your body, or ailments, or whatever else, it can be, it's any, anything that God would not want in you. Then right now, right? Just, and I'm not talking about some weird thing. Just, let's just take a second. Like, like uh, John Lake said one time. He said, okay, we prayed. Now let's just take five minutes and believe God. Right? Too many people pray and never truly believe God. It's not the praying that gets the results. It's believing. You can believe and not pray and get the results. But if you pray without believing, you won't get results. So the common denominator, the important thing, is believing. You got that? So, we're going to take just a couple of seconds here. And don't be looking around. You don't have to close your eyes, but don't, don't be wondering and all that kind of stuff. Just take a second. Decide what that problem is you've been dealing with. And just decide, know where that problem is in you, okay? And if it's in a lot of places, great. Just decide. It's just like a, um, <laughs> in the military we call it a flashbang, right? You ever see them, they pull the, the, the pin, and, and it's not really a hand grenade, it doesn't destroy anything. It just goes, boom, and it's real bright and real loud, and the whole purpose is to stun the enemy so that you can move in and take him out. Okay, that's kind of, if you've if you got problems all over, then we just want that flashbang to go off and just boom, in one moment, all over. Now if it's in one place, then you can direct it to that one place. And you can decide, at that point, you're going to let the Spirit of God out of your spirit into that one point of flesh. Amen? So you know what you're going to do, right? Pick the place where you want to release the Spirit of God. Because you direct the power of God. The Spirit of God is the power of God. You direct the power of God. John Lake said, between faith and power, choose faith. Why? Because faith directs power. You got that? You have the power. Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes. You have power. So now direct that power. By, and that power is His Spirit. So direct the spirit, direct the power into the place in your body where you need the help. You just release it. You do that by choice. You decide at, at a given point. And then, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just count down. I'll start at five and count down to one. And when I say one, you decide right now, I release. It's a decision. And then you decide as soon as you release, it's done. It's like you open the door, let it in, shut the door. It's done. You got that? Does that make sense? Do you have enough information? Okay, ready? Now, so just take a, take a breath, relax. This isn't weird, it's not, you know, don't, I don't want you tense, just relax. Now, just breathe in, breathe out, to breathe in, breathe out, just relax, right? But now know the Spirit is in you. And decide where, where He is going to go to work. Now, ready? Right now, Father, I thank, before we do it, I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you that you confirm your word with signs following. And Father, I thank you that as Moses said about the, as Psalmist David said about Moses, you showed your, your actions, your acts to the children of Israel, but you showed your ways, your methods to Moses. So Father, right now, we know that by your Spirit, we have seen your acts, and we thank you now that you have revealed your way, your method. And we thank you right now for it. We bless you, and this is all glory to you. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, 
we receive from you and we release your spirit into our flesh. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. So right now, I'm going to count down. So just get ready. When you get the one, just decide to release. To decide it is done. It is settled. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Done. Done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And it's that simple. Now you say, but shouldn't I feel something? No, no, no. Here, you're not carnal. You're operating spiritually. Don't go carnal. Carnal does what? Carnal feel, has to feel something. And carnal is never subject to the law of God. Spirit is subject to the law of God. Not what you feel, what you believe. It's believing. See, feeling saved didn't get you saved. People can feel saved and not be saved. Believing gets you saved. Amen? Believing, saved, healed, delivered, made whole. That's what saved is. Right now. See, just now, when you release God's spirit into your flesh, you are saved. You get that? Healed, delivered, made whole. Right? And it's part of your salvation. It's part of your inheritance. So now, you've settled it. It's done. That is done. And watch. Now, watch. Because you will begin to recover. If it's not completely gone already, you watch. Give it just a little bit of time. By the time we come back here this afternoon, you watch. It will be gone. Why? Because you went straight to Him and trusted Him. Amen? Amen. Okay? Amen.